Well, it, it's a pleasure to have Bill, uh, Philip Angel from the University of Georgia. He's going to tell us about compact case in the uh, Thanks for the invitation. Uh, so I wanted to start by defining uh, an integral affine structure. So uh, what is an integral affine structure on M uh, manifold? Uh, it's a collection of charts. to Rn uh, with uh, the transition functions in the integral affine transformation group. So this is the group uh, SLNZ, uh, semi-direct R to the N. So uh, we're allowed to translate our n-dimensional space and we can also apply linear matrices with integer uh, entries and determinant one. Okay, so let me give a simple example. So for instance, we could take just Rn modulo lambda, which is some uh, rank n lattice. So um, this is just equal to a flat torus. And uh, the way that you get an integral affine uh, atlas of charts is that you just take, say, a fundamental domain for the action of the lattice, uh, which is like a fundamental parallelogram, and embed that into Rn by inclusion. And then the transition functions, um, maybe you take a few copies of that, but the transition functions will just be translations. So this part in SLNZ will be the identity. Um, okay, let's give an example where it's not the identity. Um, so, um, Another example might be that we take R2, um, mod uh, Z squared, but we do something a little bit trickier. Maybe we identify this by uh, translate by one. Uh, one zero, but here, we glue sort of the bottom and the top by uh, translate. Well, first let's apply uh, 1101 and then translate by 01. So um, we could do some sort of uh, gluing here where we've applied some non trivial uh, element of SL2Z. And this would not be the same as this first example, because I was just thinking of this, where Z2 was just acting by translation. OK. Uh, OK, so I'm going to have to allow singularities of these things. So let me give a definition. So an integral affine sphere. Um, is uh, an integral affine structure uh, on S2, the two sphere with uh, 24 um, so called I1 singularities. So I'm lying a little bit. Uh, there's actually going to be an integral affine structure only on S2 uh, minus 24 points. Maybe I can put that in here, P1 through P24. But around each of these points, the integral affine structure is going to take a sort of standard 
uh, model. Okay, so, so what is the model for this singularity? So there's a couple of pictures that you could draw. One is that you take um, R2 and you cut out this triangular wedge here uh, that I've shown. And then I glue the two sides of the wedge by the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. So for instance, around some points on the edge here, I get a chart into R2. And um, the transition function is going to be this integral affine map. So this will give an integral affine structure, certainly on the complement, where the chart is just the embedding into R2 that I've drawn, certainly along the edge. But at this point here, there isn't uh, this integral affine structure doesn't extend. So this is the singularity of the affine structure. And there's actually another way to draw this, which is more canonical in some sense. So in this one, I take sort of all of R2. And what I do is I cut along the positive x-axis here. And then, so I cut, but then I re-glue the x-axis by a non-trivial map. So cut and re-glue by 1101. So maybe the observation is that if you apply the matrix 1101 to R2, it actually acts by the identity set theoretically on this axis. But because I've glued, so even on, on the level of charts, I've glued by this 1101, um, like for instance, a straight line will look like this in the outline structure. Is there a colored chalk? Oh, great. Uh, maybe, maybe red. Okay. So, so this uh, orange here is a, is a straight line in the outline structure. So the concept of a straight line, by the way, is well defined because the transition functions of an integral affine manifold preserve the concept of a straight line. Okay. Um, we'll see because so when this is the base of a Lagrangian torus vibration, there's an sort of I1 type fiber. This is the classification of Kadira fibers um, or fibers of singular fibers of elliptic vibrations. It's also called a focus focus singularity. Um, Mm, this one's better. Okay. That one's for the part for. Ah, I see. <laughs> okay. I see. Okay. So, um, so it's an annoying uh, thing to give an example of an integral affine uh, sphere because uh, I would have to draw 24 singularities, right? Which is a lot of singularities. Okay, so I'm gonna put this slightly ambiguous thing or a limit of such, which will mean that I'll allow some of the singularities to collide, okay? So there's a gauss binet type theorem, which says that there have to be if the singularities have this standard format and you have the integral affine structure on the sphere, then you must have 24 of them. This is 12 times the Euler characteristic of the sphere. Um, but they can collide and we can get sort of simpler integral affine structures. So for instance, you could take a cube
And what is the integral affine structure? Well, I sort of just have to draw for you what the, like, what the local charts into R2 look like. And the local charts, I can just take equals the flat charts into the square lattice. Okay, so um, we can, for instance, embed, if we take a, if we make this uh, sphere out of paper, then around every point except a corner, we could lay that paper flat. And uh, we do so in the plane, maybe with respect to this square lattice. So um, this sort of grid here will locally draw a picture of the embedding into R2. Okay. All right, so um, there are eight corners of the cube, and so each of these um, sort of singularities is a collision of three I1 singularities. Okay, so uh, yeah, it would be possible to sort of separate them out and give an example. All right, uh, the next sort of concept I want to define is a triangulation. Of an integral affine sphere. Uh, so what is this? This is a decomposition. into lattice triangles of area one half. All right, so uh, we could draw this, for instance, on the sphere here um, by triangulating in whatever way we see fit but into these lattice triangles of area one half. Note that area is well defined because SL2Z preserves area. Yeah, so, so yeah, like as you've sort of observed, a necessary condition for the existence of a triangulation of this form. So a necessary condition is that the singularities are at integral points. And the transition functions are in uh, uh, the subgroup uh, SL2Z semi-direct Z2. So the first, the, the sort of second point that these transition functions are in SL2Z semi-direct Z2 means that there's a well-defined notion of integral point because no matter what chart I choose, the set of integral points, this will preserve the set of integral points. And then um, you can say what it means for a singularity to be at an integral point. It means that with, res with respect to this sort of reduction of structure, the sort of standard local chart uh, puts this singularity at an integer point. Okay, so this is a, this is a um, Necessary and sufficient. That's right. Uh, well, as, assuming that it's uh, compact. I mean, of course, um, maybe you have like, you know, a disk just embedded in R2. That's an integral affine manifold, according to my definition, right? Uh, but it doesn't have a triangulation, you know, it's not compact. Okay. Philip, I have a question. Are there. Can you hear me? Uh, questions? Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? About that? Okay. So now I've defined sort of the necessary combinatorics. I want to tell you what does this have to do with K3 surfaces? Did I do this? Is this the right one? <laughs> okay, good. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm not sure. Can one hear me? Can one hear me? 
Can you hear me? Hello? Can anybody hear me? No. It should come from here. It will come from here. Did you change it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's too comfortable. Yes, are uh, they speaking now? No one's speaking. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, maybe yeah, sounds good. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, so let let's let B be a triangulated. Okay, triangulated integral outline sphere. So uh, from this, I'm going to, I want to describe how to build a singular K3 surface. So So maybe before I say uh, for more, I should define for you what a K3 surface is. Okay. So definition, uh, K3 surface. I'm not muted now, can you hear me? Is a compact, complex surface. Um, let's say X, Hello? such that the canonical bundle is trivial. Uh, equivalently, X is holomorphic symplectic or has a non-vanishing holomorphic two form. And uh, we should furthermore assume that H1 of X, the first Betty number, is zero. Okay. Uh, so when you say triangulated, that's true. Are you triangulated when the singularity is collided? No, yeah, I can allow the collided one. So for instance, you could take that cube and triangulate it sort of as I've drawn on all the faces, and that would count as an example. So it turns out there's actually going to be two ways to build a singular K3 surface. We'll need a little bit of extra data to, to give the second way. And this is going to be uh, related to uh, mirror symmetry. OK, so all right, uh, so let's let the I the uh, vertex of the triangulation. Can you hear me now? Uh, ah, yeah. Ah, very good. So I see. So it's, it's we fiddle with the audio, but uh, you said something about the integral points. I was a bit confused about that. Um, you, you said the translational part is in the Rn, but you should need Zn for that, right? Right. So uh, a necessary condition to have a triangulation is that um, the transition functions have a reduction of structure. Oh, you have that. Uh, oh, that's what you wrote. I couldn't see that. I see. Okay, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so then you have a notion of integral point, and then you additionally want the singularities to be at integral points. Okay, so let's let VI be a vertex of the triangulation, and let's assume that VI um, is a, is a non-singular vertex. So we see some triangulation into lattice triangles of area one half emanating from this point. So if we sort of draw a local chart around this point, maybe we have a lattice triangle of area one half here, something like so. So this is sort of our chart around VI. And so uh, what we see here is the fan of some toric surface. So uh, if you're not familiar with toric geometry, you can just sort of take this as a black box uh, as some way to construct a smooth um, Luyanga pair, uh, as we discussed uh, last time or last week in the workshop. Okay, so this gives a fan, 
let's say fi, which gives us um, a log floppy out pair. Um, vi and some sort of sum over j of dij. So this is a toric surface. And this uh, sum of dij is the toric boundary. So this toric boundary in this case is a sum of eight rational curves. So there's a cycle of eight P1s at the toric boundary of this toric surface. So J here, I guess, goes from one to eight. All right. Um, okay, and then there's some sort of modified recipe. Um, so modified recipe if VI is singular. So this sort of, um, I'm not gonna go into the details of this modified recipe, but the sort of key, uh, the key idea is these sort of non-toric blow-ups that were discussed uh, in the workshop. So we, we produce again, a sort of uh, log flabby au pair, a Luyenga interior, um, but it requires some, some sort of non, not something which is not completely toric. I have a question here. Um, it's me again, Barrett. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Um, so for doing this, do you assume some kind of, um, I mean, I was there in the workshop, maybe we discussed in the workshop last week, but don't you need some kind of splitting into focus, focus singularities? Yeah, so that's why I defined uh, an integral affine structure was, uh, it's it's a limit of integral affine an integral affine structure on the sphere with twenty four. I see. So you, you assume the data of how the limit arises. Yes, that's right. Or like a mutation equivalence uh, class. Of, okay, got it. Um, of that data, that's right. The yeah. So like really, the right concept of a chart. Unfortunately, like somehow, just the concept of a cone singularity is not actually enough to recover. A deformation type of one of these um, log Fabio pairs. You need some small extra amount of you know combinatorial data, which you can take, for instance, as this factorization into I one singularities. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So I'm supposed to tell you how to build a singular K three surface out of this. So essentially, what I do is I build some surface X naught. And it's just going to be the union over all the vertices vi um, of the triangulation of v of these vi sum over j of dij. And so, like for instance, uh, maybe let me draw like an example picture. Okay, so maybe I have a vertex VI here and VJ here. And I can kind of think of this surface as um, its intersection complex will be dual to the original complex. So for instance, this vertex here, we locally see the fan of P1 cross P1. So, so we have some sort of surface here, which is P1 cross P1. And it has this anti-canonical divisor, which is the union of two sections and two fibers. And then uh, we see some other surface here. Um, sorry, that was VJ. This is the surface capital VI. And here we see uh, the second Hertz Brook surface, if you are familiar with that, with its anti-canonical divisor. So, which is the toric boundary, some other toric surface. And this will continue on into the whole uh, sphere. 
So this is all living sort of on side, inside of this uh, sphere. Um, and, and sort of we've glued it in such a way that like, if you think about what the triangles correspond to, they actually correspond to triple points of this surface. So this is a singular surface because we've taken a union of two uh, smooth surfaces, but along a closed curve, right? And you know, at this point, we have a union really of three surfaces um, corresponding to the three adjacent vertices. So this is a simple normal crossings uh, surface. All right. Great. So then um, it turns out that you can actually prove that X naught deforms to a smooth K3 surface. So this is due to a theorem of Friedman's from uh, 1983. So there's a slight subtlety here, which is I haven't, um, the gluings are actually ambiguous because the two uh, sort of, when I glue two of these curves together, uh, I get two P1s and I have to glue like zero and infinity to each other, but there's some ambiguity in the gluing. So even in the building of this surface X naught, there's some ambiguity, but with the correct choices, this smooths to a K3 surface. So. Um, for instance, we're using that because each of those vertices then corresponds to a non-singular toric surface. So, so we're using it implicitly because each of the components VI is smooth. So the surface would not be simple normal crossings if the areas of triangles uh, were not one half. But it's essentially true that it will still work even if they're not one half. You, you have to like do a bit of, a little bit of work, but uh, yeah, that, that would be fine too, but we'll skip that for, for this talk. Okay, so what, the, what does this concretely mean? Um, so there exists a one parameter degeneration. Let's say X over Delta, which is equal to a disc where uh, X naught, well, is our X naught, and the fiber, say, over T is a K3. So this is for all T non-zero. All right, so let me uh, define a polarization. Of a triangulated. Integral affine sphere, so this is a weighted balanced graph. XT is a smooth K3 surface. XT is a smooth K3 surface, yeah. Um, to a K3, yeah. I, I use the term singular K3 surface, which of course is contradictory because my definition of a K3 was a compact complex surface, a smooth one. But uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of what I mean by a singular K3, like uh, X0 is that X0. Yeah, is singular, is singular, exactly. So it's this simple normal crossings, you know, four manifold or whatever. May, may right. I ask another question? Can you hear sure. me? Sure. Uh, um, so your X0, the irreducible components of X0, there is blown on toric surfaces, is that correct? So uh, to make it semi-stable. For every vertex that's uh, non-singular, 
they're, they're a toric surface with its toric boundary, with the double locus, its toric boundary. For a singular one, which is this I1 singularity, it's a single non-toric blowup of a toric surface. So it's the blow up at a at a on a point on the toric boundary, but not at the torus fixed point of a of a toric surface. But but wait, um, didn't you say you you could you could have vertices that are like have uh, more singularities, more not just one focus focus singularity? That's right. So if if something is a limit of a collision of I one singularities, or if it has a factorization into I one singularities then it requires multiple non-toric blowups. One non-toric blowup for each I1. Right, um, so, this, so this is what I was talking about, right? Absolutely, yeah, so for instance, like for the cube that I drew before, there are eight non-toric components, and each of them is a threefold non-toric blowup of a toric anti-canonical pair. In fact, there, it's the blowup at like the three points on, um, if you sort of make the, if you triangulate your cube so that each corner just looks like this, um, the, the pair here is the blow up at, um, at three points uh, on P2 with a triangle, but where I do blow ups at like uh, non torus fixed points of each. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So for instance, like this one has a, factorization into a, uh, yes. Um, this singularity factors into three I1 singularities, one going along each direction of the uh, edges of the cube. All right, so, um, okay. So a polarization of an integral affine sphere is a weighted uh, balanced graph in B, um, let's say, and I, is to be uh, supported on uh, edges of the triangulation. Okay, so for instance, let me draw a little picture here. Um, so I like I like a square lattice. It doesn't really matter, but um, why not use a square lattice? So so maybe I have. Uh, triangulation of this. Something like this. So here's a, a little piece of a triangulated integral affine sphere. And then I have some sort of graph inside of it. Um, here I drew an example here. So um, this, I should say a little bit more about this graph. It's supported on the edges. So um, associated to each edge is some primitive integral vector. And this balance condition is that if you sort of take the corresponding linear combination of primitive integral vectors, you should get zero at every vertex. So because the sum of these three vectors is zero in Z squared, this graph is balanced at this point, okay? And uh, if I want this to be balanced, I could give this edge weight too, because if I sum this vector plus this vector plus this vector plus twice this vector, I would get zero, okay? So that is a, a weighted balanced graph supported on the edges. How do you and find the balance, sorry, may I have some question? How do you find sure. balance at singular points? Great, yeah, great question. So let's, I'm going to just define it as an I1 singularity, uh, if that's okay. It's a bit more complicated at a collision, but um, essentially what you, what you need is that um, there's, there's a sort of preferred direction, uh, which is this sort of direction. Um, so this is the sort of invariant direction of the SL2Z uh, monodromy. So for instance, if the monodromy was 1101, then there's an eigen direction, which is the horizontal direction. And, and the condition to be balanced is just that the linear combination of weighted vectors be parallel to that direction. So 
the sum of, let's say, um, Nij Vj has to be parallel to the monodromy direction. And this is actually a concept which is kind of invariant no matter what chart you choose, because uh, the monodromy here is 1101. So if we change the direction of our ray by this shear, we're only adding some multiple of the monodromy direction. So the concept that a linear combination be parallel to the monodromy direction is actually well defined at this singular point. Does that, uh, is that okay? Hope it answers. Yeah, sure. This way. Okay, great. Oh, sure. Yeah. So we don't necessarily have uh, the self intersection condition, right? So the total space of this nothing is not smooth or something. Uh, like when you do space rules. Uh, no, this will be automatic. The this that the the this triple point formula. So the smoothing will be the total space will be smooth. And k trivial. Is that why we do this? Why do you... This is why we take sort of a full triangulation. Like you could consider the sub sort of complex just given by the polarization graph, but like this won't have a smooth total space when you smooth it. That's why you needed the one half thing. That's why we want the one half thing. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, great. So we have this weighted balanced graph supported on edges. And so you may know from toric geometry that if we have, let's say, some fan, so this is some fan um, with rays uh, spanned by some vectors uh, vij. So these are the, here's vi, and then these are the vectors vij too. Okay. Then, um, you know, there exists a line bundle, uh, Li over Vi, um, with Li dotted with the double curves um, equal to Nij, if and only if this sum over J. So the index I is just coming along for the ride here, is zero. So let me just uh, indicate, illustrate this by an example. So I claim that, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to change this triangulation slightly to make this a little bit more recognizable. And that's better. So, uh, ooh, I want to change it more. Okay. All right. Great. So here we have a vertex and we see the fan of P2, right? Um, and there is a line bundle on P2 whose intersection number with the three toric boundary components is one. That's the line bundle O of one on P2. Okay, so, so what does this weighted balanced graph supported on the edges give? It gives a line bundle Li, a line bundle on Vi, okay? Okay, and now we have all of these um, components, Li with, or Vi with line bundles. We can actually glue the line bundles together. I should put in Scatone here. Um, and so I can uh, glue these uh, surfaces together with the line bundles to get a singular surface with a line bundle. Um, and so what I get is an X naught L naught, um, which smooths to a polarized K3 surface. So this is a K3. Um, with an ample line bundle. All 
All right, great. So now, uh, what is the point of all of this? Okay, I'm uh, trying to, uh, I'll try to get to some kind of punchline. So when did we start at uh, three? Okay, great, great. Okay, so, So yeah, let me draw the picture of this degeneration. Now I have a degenerating family of polarized varieties um, over the disk delta. Um, so this is a... So we have some family of varieties with ample line bundles on them and complex structures. Uh, so this has, this sort of has symplectic geometry and complex geometry in it, okay? So uh, the sort of complex geometry was sort of encoded in the integral alpine sphere plus the triangulation. Okay, uh, what about the symplectic geometry? This was encoded in the weighted balanced graph. So let me sort of tell you What is the discrete Legendre transform? So uh, what I want to say is that there's actually a second degeneration of K3 services that can be encoded by this information of a polarized integral affine sphere. Um, okay. So let me sort of draw a heuristic picture. We have our sphere. We have some set of singularities. Um, and then we have this weighted balanced graph, right? So maybe it goes through some vertices, goes around to the back of the sphere. Okay. Something like this. Uh, so we have uh, maybe live, let me give a name to a, a polarization. Let me call L integral affine. Okay, so I have this L integral affine. And I also have, uh, yeah, this integral affine sphere B. Okay, so the the uh, one way to understand mirror symmetry is that you can interpret the same object as the fan of one thing, but as the polytope of another, okay? So that's like combinatorially what mirror symmetry comes down to is just to reinterpret a fan as a polytope and vice versa. Okay, so the question is, well, we've, we've interpreted this triangulated integral affine sphere as a fan because out of sort of all the fans around vertices, we built some singular K3 surface and then we smoothed it. So the question is, how do we interpret this picture as a polytope? Okay, well, the way to do it is to think of each region sort of in the complement of this red graph as the base of a Lagrangian torus vibration on some louis Enga pair. Okay, so. Um, each sort of um, region uh, in B sort of bounded by, bounded by 
the support of this uh, sort of integral affine graph. That is the set of edges on which the weights are positive, right? Um, is the base of a Lagrangian torus vibration. So let's like give a name to one of these regions. Maybe we think about this region, which sort of then goes around to the back. Okay. So let's let me call this region uh, PI. Okay. So there exists some other surface. Uh, let me call it VI check, sum over J of DIJ check. Um, and now I'll say omega I for a, a symplectic form, fibering over PI by some map mu I. This is a Lagrangian torus vibration. So this also uh, lets me kind of uh, restate why why I called those singularities I one singularities. So these these singularities here correspond to the singular fibers of this Lagrangian uh, torus vibration. Okay, so over over one of these orange fibers, we have like um, this sort of focus focus singularity for the model. May I ask a question for for the Lagrangian torus vibration? Do you use this Symington kind of picture? That's right. Yeah. So uh, that's right. That's uh, absolutely correct. Um, there is something that kind of breaks down here when you allow the singularities to collide, though, which is that it's not really clear what to put as the singular fiber if you have a bunch of I1 singularities that collide. But sort of on the symplectic level, everything is pretty floppy. So, you know, they can happen at the corners. Yeah, so then that wouldn't really. But see, this has an I1 um, direction. So you could move it slightly in that direction and it would be inside. But yeah, so really the proper thing to do is to, so there's this operation called a nodal slide on these I1 singularities. You should do some small nodal slide. It doesn't matter. Well, it, uh, let's see. Uh, no, it matters because the polarization, there's going to be kind of a preferred direction because. Yeah, yeah, but there's going to be two different polygons you can enter into. No, yeah, you don't want to, you don't necessarily want to factor it exactly how to say. Um, maybe the proper thing to do here is, so really the correct thing to do is that you have this triangulation additionally, right? So really what you're doing is you're gonna replace every vertex with, uh, of the triangulation with a Symington polytope for that line bundle, for the red line bundle. So for instance, this vertex will get replaced with a polytope of O of one. But if you have one of these singularities, you still have the con one of these Symington sort of vibrations. So it's sort of like a polytope, but it has a, some singularity inside. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> but like, for instance, yeah, you could imagine that like, um, you could imagine that all of the singularities are at vertices, and then you really just see polytopes of toric varieties. So all of these components will be toric varieties. It's okay. probably a question of uniqueness of these things. It, they should be model I, I guess, of this uh, Lagrangian fibration and of the symplectic structure. Um, so there, there may be some kind of moduli, but 
But what we're ultimately going to extract is just the class of this um, Li, the cohomology class. So, um, so I sort of want to say that I want to define Li check as the class of this um, omega i. Okay, so this is uh, in the cohomology of uh, vi with coefficients in z. Uh, and it defines uh, some sort of ample line bundle. And so what I can do is I can form some sort of X naught check, L naught check, which is the union of these guys. Uh, and then smooth. So I smooth and I get some sort of X check, L check. Over a disk, uh, again, a degeneration of K3s. But you can sort of see this reinterpretation of the base as like um, it's some sort of like tropical. Uh, it's sort of how you can realize like mirror symmetry tropically in the sort of style of the Gross-Siebert program. Um, like this discrete Legendre transform can be thought of simply as like reinterpreting the base, um, uh, you know, as a polytope. Okay, so, so I have these uh, degenerations of K3 surfaces, and I, I want to sort of understand in what way they're related. So um, maybe the, uh, so theorem, um, due to myself and Friedman, and there's a sort of, uh, Another version of this theorem in my paper with uh, Alex Evan Thompson is that um, the Picard Lefschetz transform So the Picard Lefschetz transform of the degeneration. let's say uh, X over this delta. Um, so what is the picard lefschetz transform? Uh, let's say, so T, uh, it's sort of the identification of the cohomology of this general fiber with itself um, by sort of parallel transport of the gauss manin connection. So since all of these general fibers are smooth, I can you know, go around the puncture um, and I can sort of see a transformation from the integer cohomology of a general fiber to itself. So, uh, so uh, first of all, this has a logarithm, uh, n, which is log t, and it has a certain formula. So maybe this is not the theorem yet, um, um, where n of x equals uh, something like this. Um, and with these classes can be understood in terms of a certain diffeomorphism between, um, between xt and xt check. So. What is the what? Like what? I don't understand. What, what is the right hand? 
Uh, oh yeah, sorry. So this is the this is the sort of cup product in cohomology. So in on H two of a surface, there's this sort of cup product valued in Z, right? Uh, cup. And so we get some integers here, and these delta and lambda are in H two of X T. So there's these certain classes such that the that the logarithm of the monodromy has this form. And furthermore, there exists a sort of natural, there exists a diffeomorphism B from XT to XT check, uh, such that uh, delta ends up being identified with the fiber class of a point. This is the fiber class of the Lagrangian torus vibration. Um, maybe I should say phi lower star. Phi lower star of lambda is identified with the class of the symplectic form. Okay, so uh, what is the sort of punchline here? Well, if we want to understand the generations of K3 surfaces, we need to understand how to fill in any family, no matter what its picard lefschetz transformation is. So if you give me a picard lefschetz transformation, I need to tell you what sort of singular K3 surface I should fill in. And then that will give a compactification of the moduli of K3s. Okay, so the sort of upshot So let me sort of say the upshot um, Yeah, that's right. So I had these I had Lagrangian torus vibrations on each component of the central fiber, which sort of collapsed to circles over the edges and points over the vertices. But then on the smoothing xt of x naught, this Lagrangian torus vibration will sort of have um, two torus fibers, you know, even over the sort of edges and vertices. So you'll undo the symplectic uh, boundary reduction along this LIA when you smooth. Okay. So the upshot is to, to get. Um, a singular K3 um, X naught for all possible um, Picard left jets transformations So this is encoded in these delta and lambda. Um, we just need to write down a sort of appropriate family of Lagrangian torus vibrations uh, over the sphere. Write down a family of Lagrangian torus vibrations. So let me just sort of say in one example what this uh, family of Lagrangian torus vibrations um, looks like, and then I'll stop. So for instance, uh, example, Um, is for degree two K threes. So let's let uh, X L be a degree two K three. 
So that is to say that if we take the first churn class of the line bundle and take its self-intersection in the cohomology, we get two. So all of these, well, actually not all, but generically, these are double covers of P2, uh, double cover branched over um, some sort of sextic curve. Okay. And uh, there's 19 dimensions of moduli, of complex moduli of these, corresponding to the 19 dimensions of moduli of sextic curves in P2. Okay, so somehow I want to say if I have a degenerating family of um, degree two K3s, what sort of singular K3 surface should I fill in? So the first, uh, the first remark is that there exists this um, a divisor uh, R in X, which is the ramification locus of pi. Ramification of pi. And this R is um, in, it's a, it is the vanishing locus of a section of uh, this line bundle to the third power. Okay, so um, let me draw a sort of picture. So, okay, so, so this is some, this is supposed to be uh, 18 gone in R2. And uh, this 18 gone is like L1, V1, L2, V2, L3, V3, et cetera, L18, V18. So these VI are sort of uh, fixed vectors uh, in Z2. Okay, so first of all, to form this polygon, I need the condition that the sum of Li, VI is the zero vector in R2. So this is two conditions. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do three of these sort of surgeries that I drew where I cut out a sort of triangle and add a singularity. And so the height of this triangle is some extra parameter. This is L19, L20, and this is L21. And so really what I've constructed here is some integral affine structure on the sphere, which depends on these L1 through L21. And, but because there's two linear conditions on these Li, this is in R to the 19. This 19 is not a coincidence with the dimension of moduli. So if I call this sort of integral affine, so I've glued these two together and I get three I1 singularities at these three points. And I can sort of define this to be P. And uh, how do I build this B? It's just the union of two copies of P. So I take P, I take the union with another copy, but with the opposite orientation. And I have six I1 singularities from these three here, three in the opposite one. But then I, because I have 18 corners, I get 18 more I1 singularities along the equator. And so this is a integral affine sphere with 24 singularities. And it turns out that by just drawing this picture, you can describe uh, using the recipe that I said earlier, any degeneration of these degree two K3s. Um, so like the, the sort of key point is that when uh, these Li are in Z to the 19, instead of R to the 19, this gives, um, this gives, all possible degenerations. 
of degree two K3s. And therefore it gives you a sort of, it describes a sort of compact moduli space of a compactification of the moduli space. Okay, so I guess uh, I haven't explained everything about this example, but I should stop since I'm probably over time already. Okay. Any questions from the room? I lost you. So how do we, okay, if there's a survival ramification, then where did the state take down come from? Yeah, so good question. Can you uh, repeat the question? I couldn't hear it. Write it down. It is seemingly, you know, um, completely pointless. Uh, but we certainly, you know, given these specific 18 vectors, you know, and this uh, condition amongst these 18 positive real numbers, Li, um, we can form this polygon. And then, you know, given three more numbers, we can make these surgeries and produce an integral affine structure on the sphere. Okay. But then the sort of key point of, of doing that was that when we consider this base as the base of a Lagrangian torus vibration, on this mirror K3, um, these, the classes of these symplectic forms range over all possibilities of, like, of this sort of class lambda. Because we had sort of in that mirror theorem that I wrote down that under the stiffeomorphism, the sort of this invariant of the picard lefschetz transformation was identified with the class of the symplectic form. And so because we sort of wrote down this integral affine sphere for all possible classes of symplectic form here, we end up getting kind of um, a procedure to describe the central fiber of any degeneration of uh, K3s of degree two. So the procedure is that, you know, any degeneration has some picard lefschetz transformation. There's some lambda. So it corresponds to some Lagrangian torus vibration that we've built. And then um, because lambda is integral, this sort of is really encoding the lambda. Because lambda is integral, um, we can triangulate this sphere into those triangles of area one half and build the central fiber of the degeneration. So it sort of tells you what the limit is of that degenerating family. Um, it, yeah, it gives like a recipe for inputting the picard lefschetz transformation of a degeneration, which is something seen only on the punctured family, right? It's just the action on the cohomology of a loop. So, like, where does the two? Ah, like, uh, yeah. So, why is this the right picture for degree two? Maybe, yeah. Sorry. So, the point is that uh, degree two K threes have an involution. Iota, right? Which is just to flip the two sheets of the double cover. This integral affine structure also has an involution, which is to flip the two hemispheres. And so um, this ramification divisor will correspond to the equator. So I guess I was using red before. Whatever. I'll, yeah. So this, this ramification divisor corresponds to the equator of the sphere. And so this is sort of this, this is your LIA. So, um, yeah, or it's really three LIA, sorry. But... No, I mean, you can't have a regular 18 gone with, uh, with edges parallel to Z. Why does it introduce an I1 singularity at each corner here? Why does introducing an I1 singularity just, uh... Yeah, good question. Okay, so the point is just that, um, like, let me just look at one edge of the 18 gone. Okay, so I have like P here, right? And then I'm gluing it. So here's P. And then I have P off. The sort of the same integral affine disk with the opposite orientation. 
And now I have some point here where clearly like it, the gluing doesn't actually work, right? So what I do is I, I choose th this vectors. I choose these vectors VI minus one VI. <laughs> I've broken so many pieces of chalk, I'm sorry. Um, such, that, um, such that the thing which would identify these two edges is conjugate to one, one, zero, one. And then clearly then I can glue by putting in a singularity an I1 singularity here. So, I mean, of course, I, like around such a corner point, I must have a singularity because if I try to glue two polygons. When you come back around or something, like how, isn't there any conditions on well, these vectors are sort of chosen carefully. I mean, they're not randomly chosen. These are certain fixed vectors in Z2 such that okay. this construction will work. Yeah. yeah. They are certain, it's a specific list of 18 vectors. Yeah. Um, yes. You can't just do it randomly. No. Other questions? Uh, you have a question about the development sphere. Yeah. Uh, how general could it be seen in our construction? By just the uh, uh, sphere with some initial similarities and the uh, singular. Yeah, so the condition that you need is this like, well, one, that the singularities kind of factor into these I1 singularities. Uh, two, like you need the. Um, I mean, you need this triangulation sort of into these lattice triangles of area one half. But then with that, you know, given that those conditions hold, you can always build this sort of singular K3 surface. Um, just by this sort of procedure that I, that I was saying, like you take, you interpret each vertex as the fan of some surface, toric surface, and then you glue those, uh, those toric surfaces together. And you know, do a modified construction for the for the singular points. So, so just a general way of encoding degenerations of K threes. Okay, so, yeah. So maybe yeah. you can ask uh, later. Let's also see if there are any Zoom questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions actually. Um, so first, it wasn't clear to me. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear it now. Okay. Um, um, so first, I have a couple of questions. First, I didn't see the triangulation anymore in your last model in the genus two model. Uh, what happened to these to the triangulation? Um, what's the relevance of the triangulation, sort of? No, uh, I know that. Sure. <laughs> Where is it? You you just drew uh, two polygons. Well, Ah, uh, of course, right. So the point is that when, that's right, yeah. So it's because I've left out the steps as usual, but like, so I drew this polygon, but it hasn't been triangulated yet. But because all of these LIs are in Z to the 19, it certainly admits some lattice triangulation. So I choose one um, arbitrarily, subject to the condition that it's invariant under the involution and it sort of contains the equator, right? So, so I choose this triangulation. And now, because there was some dependency, um, so I choose this triangulation and I create some surface X naught. Um, so the objection might be, well, like clearly the central fiber of my degeneration has depended then on my choice of triangulation. But in a moduli space, I should have like a unique limit, right? Like if I want my moduli space to be Hausdorff, for instance, like I want there to be a unique limit of any degeneration. And clearly there are many possible choices of triangulation here. Okay, so the way to sort of deal with this we, is that first of all, we also have this line bundle um, uh, from uh, the sort of red graph here, which is a weighted balanced graph. And, and what I really need to do is I need to take 
the sort of canonical model like with respect to this line bundle. So I should take proj of the direct sum of H naught of N L naught over And you're saying this is independent of the triangulation. This is actually independent of the triangulation because yeah, the line sure. bundle is, is actually the trivial bundle on this sure. whole thing. So the sure. whole, each of the hemispheres collapses to a single point um, when we take this sort of canonical model. So what happens with the model I on the, I mean, how big is your boundary? Right, so there is this additional moduli, which is like how all the double curves get glued. There, were, there was a C star of freedom actually for each double curve. And so the sort of all the possible C stars of like re-gluing these double curves encode the sort of moduli at the boundary of the um, of K3s. So like at the boundary of K3 moduli, like the boundary divisors or, or components are parameterized by tori, C star to some power. And uh, that's sort of what's happening here is that that C star to some power is realized by varying the gluings kind of. Okay, and then the last, uh, maybe the last question or remark, and I'm not sure how to put this without sounding offensive. Um, I, I mean, you know that Mark and I have worked for 20 years on, on, on very related things. And I think I didn't see much that isn't already in our papers in a way. I mean, not the genus two model, but what you said about like model I, picolectric transformations and all these kind of things, you are aware of that there's a, that in various papers like discrete load wrong transform. And then once you do this, you're in a in a in a good setup that we are happy to work with. We have identified all the model I, we have canonical models, smoothings, and so on, right? So right, yeah. yeah so it's all kind of by a minor modification, just pushing the button. It sounds like you're reinventing reinventing the wheel for for me. That's what it, it sounds like to me. Uh, sorry, I, it I sounds know. like you're reinventing the wheel. Are you reinventing the wheel? Oh, reinventing the wheel. Um, I see. Um. Uh, not that I know. Um, I think that like somehow, um, from my understanding, I, I, it's certainly like very much in line with the Gross Seabird program. Like essentially the construction is working just on the dual side where in which you do like some kind of fan construction instead of a polytope construction. Yeah, but it's so, the same like, thing, right? You the, just replace a fan by the, by the dual thing and then you have, have cones, right? But I guess the difference is kind of that, like when you do some fan construction, like you don't have the information of theta functions, right? Um, so well, like, but you, there's some sort of like, um, we like, you know, like we don't, I think that, you know, the-, the But you have the a polarization, sort of but you have of, a polarization. Uh, is sort of like, it's much more ambitious to try to construct these theta functions. No, forget about the theta I, functions. That's, that's details of the construction. But I mean, you know, we had it off in our first paper, we had the fan picture and worked with the fan picture because we felt that it's, it's, it's more natural if you're just interested in the complex geometry. And later on, we learned that once you have a polarization, it comes for free, okay? Everything comes for free. The cone picture comes for free. And it's more convenient and more canonical to work on the on the dual side. You are working on the dual side anyway, right? So you have to see, as long as, you, as you're not, not in this situation where you push a lot of singularities, I mean, if you actually have singularities in the vertices, I mean, the, sorry, in the zero dimensional strata of the center fiber, but as long as you as you look at a situation where you have a blown up toric surface on the center fiber as a reducible component, we are totally happy to work with our models. Okay. If you have an X0 that is a, has components that are blown up toric surfaces and you have a polarization, that fits into a program. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. And, that's I, what you're, and you're just encoding the situation by in a fan picture. I mean, yeah. So what's, what's the difference? I mean, we know this for a long time. So 
one difference seems to me that he doesn't use scattering diagrams and uses this abstract theorem about smooth things. Yeah, sure. I mean, we know that for K3 surfaces, we, you know, in dimension two, we knew this, knew this like in 2003. You don't need to do anything special. I mean, if you have a lot, if you have a lot smooth K3 surface, I mean, degenerate K3 surface, it has unobstructed deformations. That's a kind of a modern version of the Friedman Scatoni theorem or just Friedman theorem. You don't need to do anything. Um, then you can just see its unobstructed deformations. So, yes, we don't need that. I mean, I think that maybe the main uh, sort of like applications of interest are like where you can sort of explicitly compactify the moduli by writing down. Um, like which specific integral affine structures and which moduli of affine structures are relevant. And then once you have that, this recipe sort of tells you explicitly what the central fiber is. So maybe it's just about like explicitness in some way, but yeah. I mean, I mean what I learned like from the, I mean, what I really liked is this model for genus two. Okay, so you have a specific model for genus two where you can realize all Pico Lipschitz transformations. Uh, this is something I definitely didn't know. Um, but once you put this in, I can think you can just push the button, run our program, and everything will be there. I, well, then we should definitely discuss more. Yeah, sure. I think you should, but we should end the talk, and then maybe we'll continue discussing. So uh, thanks uh, to our speaker again.